The title, you're thinking, okay, that doesn't make sense. Well, it's not going to make sense to you yet. Um, the title for tonight is, it's been about 50 years. And it'll make sense to you in a little bit. You just got to hang tight. So first thing I want to do is I want us to look at something that we've referenced a lot. Uh, the pastors at this church, have, we, we've talked about it. We've plastered on walls. We put it on shirts. We talk about the Great Commission, right? You've heard it several times. Um, we've mentioned it. We've had whole sermons about the Great Commission. We reference it in, in songs. We sing about it. We say that's what we're doing when we're going out and on mission trips and things like that. So what I want to do tonight is I want to talk briefly about Jesus' teaching on the Great Commission. Now, if you study through the book of Matthew, I think it's pretty neat how the structure, and you know, don't, don't, don't think of this as some kind of spiritual, mystical kind of, oh, that's, that's why it happened like that. But in the book of Matthew, what you have is you have narrative-type settings that Jesus would put an end cap on that narrative with a, a, a set of teaching. And after that set of teaching, there would be some instruction that he would send people out with, and it would kind of show that instruction taking place. And so various times, various blocks, you can actually carve out sections of Matthew and do that. Well, it kind of falls off the bandwagon at the very end because Jesus gives his last, his final command is the Great Commission, and then it stops. The book of Matthew ends after that. And I think that that's, I think the reason is because after that final command from Jesus, he's still sending his, his disciples, sending his people out to fulfill, to complete, to accomplish that command that he's, he's given his people to fulfill. And I think that's really unique and I think it's special. But one of the things that we can accuse ourselves of uh, in the Western world, in American Christianity, and it's said like this in various books and various pastors would, would maybe reference it like this, that Jesus' last and greatest command is our least concern. And so let's, let's just take a, a snapshot of the Great Commission real quick and see what God has for us. So let's read it. Um, Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20. I have it right there for you. You don't have to open your Bible. You can just uh, maybe make note if you want to um, put your marker in your scripture to read later. If you have a different translation, this is the English Standard Version. Uh, some of the words might be a little bit different in your translation. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Okay, so now Jesus is talking to who? His followers, right? And when they saw him, they worshipped him. What is the next phrase? But some doubted. What are they doubting? What are they... And see, when you look at the, the way this word is formed in the original language, they're not doubting Jesus' divinity. They're not doubting whether or not he was actually resurrected. They're not doubting. It, this, this some doubted, it's not an external, I'm doubting something that I'm you know, perceiving in something else. It's an internal doubt, So, which is good because it makes sense when you think of his, his command that he leaves us with which is the Great Commission, as he gives us his command, some doubt it. Why are they doubting? They're doubting themselves. They're seeing Jesus. He gathers his disciples together. They worship him. Now, if, it was some, if, if some people were, were thinking that he's the Messiah and some people were doubting whether he really is, then that's what it would say. But it said they worship him, but some were doubting. Okay? So that's kind of how you got to look at that, or you'll miss kind of some importance with the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and what? Make disciples of all nations. That phrase, all nations, literally means pontata ethne, all nations, ethno-linguistic people groups. He's telling his disciples, his followers, these are some ruffian, misfit no good wash. I mean, they, they didn't, they got picked last with kickball field. I mean, these were tax collector, fishermen, foul mouth sailors kind of thing, okay? He looks at them and he tells them, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. 
And then what happens? There's this uh, amazing, and Luke picks up in the book of Acts, the ascension, where they're like, oh, and he goes away, that kind of thing. And they're sitting there staring. I mean, can you imagine Jesus? He's, he's been spending time with people after his resurrection. There's no doubt that he's physically, literally resurrected alive. He gets lifted up in the clouds, and his followers are just kind of looking up at the sky. And the next thing you know, what? A couple of dudes are standing there next to him saying, what are you all looking at? What are you looking at? And so what are they, they're still, I believe that once he left, that some doubted, I think that probably increased a little bit. And maybe that's just me looking at myself in that situation, because it would for me. And I would even doubt myself more if Jesus left. So let's look at this first, this first question. What are the two main verbs? Or you can scratch out verbs if you would like and put a stronger word. Take your, you got some pens? You're going to need some pens tonight, by the way. It would be helpful. You don't have to have it. So you can scratch out verbs and put commandments. So in this section of Scripture, there are two main commands, two imperatives is what it would be called. What are those? Go and make. Okay. Any other thoughts? Which, and it's, it's real easy to think that go and make are the two main imperatives, the two commands in this passage of Scripture, but they're not. The first commandment is make disciples. Now, make disciples was mistranslated in the King James. The King James says, teach all nations. There's a difference between teaching people and making disciples. Make disciples is the first verb, and the next verb, or the next imperative, next command from Jesus is Listen, you, you miss it. Everybody, I, the second command in this passage is, and behold. It is. So when you look at our English language, you look at words like go, you think, well, that's a, I mean, that's pretty strong, right? If I was, if you came to, to my house, you showed up at my front door, and you came and said, hey, Rod, how's it going? And I said, go. You'd be like, Wow, that's a pretty strong command, brother. Calm down. But in in the in the language, in the original language, this is this is not a a command, it's really a participle, which basically means this. As you're going, make disciples. While you're going, make disciples. The biggest, fattest, strongest command in this passage, Jesus' last command that he gives his followers is make disciples. And the supporting command is, and behold. Behold, or lo, or listen. Listen to what? Jesus is teaching. Jesus is saying, here's the truth of the matter. Go make disciples, but always on the front, forefront of your mind, lo, behold. Be, like when you're beholding something, you're like, man, there it is right there. I beheld the beauty of that uh, delicious steak, right? Behold, like if you're sitting at the table and you're looking around at something else and someone says, behold that food, you, that's a command for you to look at that. So Jesus is saying, behold, behold what? I'm with you. So Jesus is saying, as you're going, make disciples. But pay attention as you go, pay attention to the truth of the matter that I'm with you. So you're not going to go anywhere that I'm not going to go with you. I remember the, um, when, when I went to China, I thought I wasn't going to come home the first time. I thought I was going to go to prison for the rest of my life in China. I just thought it, just, it was that bad. And different scenarios were playing out, that kind of thing. When I had the opportunity to go back to China after I finally made it back to the States, like I wrestled with this idea of, like, okay, God, the first time I went, like I thought they were going to arrest me and throw me in some federal Chinese prison. I'm not sure if I want to go back to China. It, what God comforted me with was the simple fact that God's like, hey, you know what? you got to go, but check it out. Behold, I'm going with you. And that's, that was helpful for me. So that's kind of some, some things, and you can really pick apart this great commission and make it make sense for you as a believer. Let's, let's watch this video if it's, if it's still working, and then we'll get back to our, uh, I'm hoping it works. Trust in technology.
possible would take root. My parents were faced with a decision. Finally, Dad explained to us how that if they kept on planning, we could no longer stay. But the Sawi were desperate to keep us around, so they finally agreed to make peace with each other. In order for that to happen, each Sawi village gave an infant, a baby boy, to their enemies. And this child became known as the Peace Child. It was through this unexpected exchange, very deep in their culture, that my parents were given a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with the Sawi to explain to them that God sent his very own peace child, Jesus, to make peace with us. It's been 50 years since that day, and we are very anxious to see how the Sawi are doing. It's uh, fairly early in the morning on June 23rd. Taking us to the same place for every night. Yeah, to the very same spot. It's great to see so many old people. The seas took its toll. Death from warfare took its toll. But now to come back and see that there are just throngs among the crowds of people. Throngs of people with gray hair and old enough that they have trouble walking along the trail. That's a special time. So the story or anything. What what struck struck a chord with you? Anything? A lot, probably. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Yeah, fifty years later. I mean, um, it's yes, ma'am. Uh, Don Richardson. And there's a book that came out about 50 years ago called Peace Child. And in this book, he explains how him, his wife, and his little boy moved to this headhunter tribe. And there's other warring tribes around. And they, one thing, I don't know if you caught, but they, there's, there was, before there was no old people in any of these tribes because they would just kill each other off. And, it, and the, to me, the, 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 I mean, there's several things that are really impactful about the story, but the, the main overarching giant huge gospel in it is the peace child. That these, these tribes were worn against each other and the way that they would try to make peace is they would offer a baby boy to their enemies. And that's, that's what God has done. He's offered his son to his enemies. You. You savage headhunter is what you were. And he said, I want to make peace with you. And Don was able to you know, infiltrate their culture with the gospel, and obviously it was culture shifting, absolutely radically changing everything about their, their culture. Anything else that really stood out to you? Anything that you disliked? Bothered you? Bothered you about yourself after watching that? I mean, what, what, anything? Well, I, I think that... Uh... You know, when you see people like that, you think they're so far, you know, so primitive and so incapable, you know, and, you know, they're all, you know, you, you just don't realize sometimes you think the culture you were raised in, you, you naturally look down at, at those people are being less, less of you, down almost in a way. Yeah. And to see that, I know when we went to Belize the last time, it was pouring down rain. We went to this little bit of church and went to a Sunday school. This little center block built. There was four guys in there that had been discipled through that program. And the message that they taught that morning just blew me back. You know, and I had the attitude, you know, in a way you kind of think, you know, you're more educated. And yeah. Somehow more spiritual. Like you got you got something more than they have kind of thing. But. I got served in there. I mean, just yeah. nothing else. You know, that was really impactful. Anything else? I know we could probably start pulling random. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
ability to do that. Yeah, that was a lot of work. Um, the Richardson, the that family, they were um, they were trained. They were sent out by an agency. They were, you know, they spent a, a lot of time once they got there. To I mean, it wasn't just like, hey, we're going to go catch a flight over here. I mean, it was very strategic. Um, but it was, yeah, it was, it was really hard work what they did. It was a big step of faith. And I think that, that they're, they're an example of uh, taking the gospel to Pontotai Ethne, to all nations. Let's, let's, um, let's pick back up because I want us to really get something with this because I think what might happen after watching that, because I think what happens to a lot of people, you know, you're, you're, you're a good American citizen. You pay your taxes. You try to obey the speed limit. You want to come to church. You want your kids to get saved, and you want them to, you know, be able to check the boxes, so to speak, in their lives. You know, they were they they did the Awana verses. They got baptized, that kind of thing. Like you want to be a kind, nice person. But then things like this is kind of you're like, well, maybe I'm just maybe I've totally blown it because I'm not like the Richardson family, and I'm not like hop on a plane and take. I mean, can you imagine taking your seven-month-old, little bitty, pale-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white little boy to a, to a headhunter tribe and say, here we are, this is home now. For most of us, we kind of feel like, man, they, they nailed it, and I'm stinking it up. And I think that's okay for us to kind of wrestle with that a little bit, but I think there's something a little more going on, too, that we can see, and maybe that's something that we can pull out when we talk about this next one. How is the story of the Richardson family and the Sawi tribe an example of intentionally multiplying the Christian faith in others? Anybody? How is, how is what we, we saw, how is that an example of intentionally multiplying the, the Christian faith in others? Yeah. So they're making disciples. Did you notice that like they, they didn't get there and just try to turn them into, you know, make, make them think like they thought. They, they, they took the, the gospel message and they tried to make it make sense in their culture. And they raised up people in that devastating culture. I mean, you think, uh, that would be like all of us here in, you know, the north part of Gulfport, like you, you go south of I-10, there might be somebody down there with a, with a spear ready to, kill you and eat you. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we, we can't really have a, a framework for that type of thinking. That's a jacked up culture that God sent the gospel through this cute white family to. But you can see how the, the beautiful gospel is what grated against that culture. And that's what was culture changing. And it wasn't just, hey, let me, let me teach you a bunch of Bible stuff. It's let me, let me walk with you. Let me show you Jesus. Let me show you Jesus in my life. Let me, let, let me live among you. Let me love among you. Let me try to get Scripture and the truth of the gospel to kind of rub up against your value system, your culture, the framework of your understanding of what makes sense. Because everything that made sense to those tribes, it doesn't make sense to us. Like It doesn't make sense for you to think, well, today's a good day to go kill my neighbor. Because their last name's different than mine. And their family heritage is different than mine. It doesn't make sense to us. But let's be honest, that's a jacked up culture, right? That, that's what made sense to them. And, and here's where we can just drag it and plop it on our plate tonight. We, we, we kind of have a jacked up culture, wouldn't you say? I mean, it doesn't take us long to read the newspaper, the Facebook feed, watch the news. To you, you, I know what you want to do. You want to like pull your hair out sometimes. You want to pull off your ears and stomp on them because you're tired of hearing. All the messed up stuff that's all around us. So what's going to make a difference? The, the gospel is going to be what makes a difference. But not just people that know the truth of the gospel and have the teachings of Jesus and just like throwing the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of the Bible. What's going to make sense and what's going to be culture changing is walking with people in the midst of the, the dirt paths. Like, I'm, I'm going to step, skip out on a headhunter meeting tonight, but I'll pray for you guys. Like, it's going to be... People who know Jesus and love Jesus, who are countercultural, who don't have the same uh, value system as the culture has, but has a value system that's based on Scripture and the Bible, it's going to take those people, go into, to, into that culture, next to the people in that culture, and saying, this is kind of how we see things, and I'm going to, you think and you believe and you embrace things that are 
totally opposite to what I think is good. Like nobody in here would say that taking a spear is a good thing and go you know, stab a whole family and kill them. Like, no, like we don't think like that. But do you see how that makes kind of sense in our culture, how we live in a kind of a, there's some backwards things that our, our culture says, hey, that's okay. We embrace that. That's what we like. But as Bible-believing Christians, we're like, no, that's not part of our value system. And then what we do is we, we have a tendency to kind of push back away from that crazy culture and say, well, I'm going to be safe in my value system, and I'm going to find other people that's, that kind of think safely in my value system, and I'm going to bring these people around me, and we're going to be safe together. But that, that doesn't change the culture. That's not, and that's what the Richardson family knew. Like they got to, they got to, they got to have a revolutionary, culture-changing movement, or else these tribes are going to, you know, drift off into eternity—a Christless eternity. And they weren't okay with that. And so that's why that's one of the things that, like, God's doing a special work in our church recently, and it has to do with discipleship. There's a lot of talk. Have you been catching on a lot of the discipleship talk that we're hearing? And one of the things that, that I believe and that, that we believe is that um, the, the culture shift that this country needs is going to happen with discipleship. It's going to happen with multiplying your faith in discipleship. That's the, that's the only way. That's the only way it happened in those tribes. You, know, you can't snap somebody out of a value system and say, that's stupid, you're wrong, this is, this is what's right, this is right here is right. That's, because that's not how people think. Because they're like, no, I think it's okay to stab somebody and put their skull on my mantle. Well, that's stupid. Like, no, that's not right. But you, you have to infiltrate the culture with the gospel. And then you see how they were teaching others. That's what, I, I think it was a beautiful picture to that plane pull up. And like all these other cultures that used to kill each other, now they're like playing volleyball, smiling. It's culture changing. And it was them going and walking with people, with their faith, over long periods of time. Okay, I get it. I finally get it. That whole peace child thing. That's making sense to me. It wasn't just a snap of the finger and all these tribes started loving each other. No, they had some meetings. <laughs> they had some like, hold on, like we see that Jesus is this peace child that's that God has sent to his enemies to make to make things right with us. Did they knew that they were going to get up? Did these people knew that the missionary was going to go there? Um, if you read the book, uh, there's kind of some initial contact that, that the Richardson family had, but you know, it's not like, I mean, they, they, they kind of halfway expected that they would be rejected in that culture, right? I mean, they're not just going to be like, hey, we're totally different than you. We have different beliefs than you, and we're just going to accept you. I mean, at night, you know, there's some nights where like, I, hope, I sure hope nobody sneaks in our house tonight and just gets rid of these culture changers. <laughs> so there's, there's part of that. I mean, obviously there's fear going into it. He's like, doo, doo, doo. they were just like bound in there, like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Like, yeah, it's seasons of prayer and wrestling with God. And like, God, are you serious? You want us to do this kind of thing? So, but a lot of that's spelled out in detail with, with the book Peace Child, if you want to pick up a copy of that. This is Tony's, so I can't give this to you tonight. If it's mine, I'll give it to you. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's keep going because I think that some of these other questions are and some good, good things to think about. Um, in a video, one of the Richardson men said, uh, one of the, the sons said, something has been implanted in the hearts of the Saudi people, and they aren't just sitting around enjoying Christ and getting fat and happy. They're sharing it with others. See, the multiplication factor happened, the discipleship reproducing factor happened, when the Richardson family focused on a few people, and those people, what? Multiplied. Multiplied, multiplied, multiplied. And that's when you have several entire different tribes that's just totally infiltrated with the gospel. And then now they come together. And you hear how they're saying, like, like the tribes are intermarrying now, and they're, like, hanging out together. It's just un totally unheard of. So what are, some, what are some amazing Christian things that are totally unheard of in our culture today that we would like to see happen? I mean, wouldn't it be great if, like, 
like we heard like 50 years from now. Like our kids are talking about like, hey, you know what? The government, whether it's in the White House, whether it's in the representative, like state, this or that, like they don't do anything until they spend an hour praying over it and talking about their Bible study quiet time that they had earlier that morning. Like that's how our government works. That's not true today. Why? Because they're headhunting today, right? they got skulls on their mantle places. And so for us as Christians... Like, we have to, we can't just be like, like, push back against this crazy headhunting tribe that we live uh, among. But to be like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start multiplying. I'm going to start multiplying. I'm going to start multiplying. So here's a story about a pastor who went into a church, jacked up church. Like, I have, it, so many, I have so many friends in the ministry, and I lead conversations all the time, and I'm just, like, so thankful for, for us, for you. And so he went, he took this church, this pastor, this church that people were, his friends were saying, you are crazy to go there as a pastor. They're going to eat you alive. And so he's like, okay, God's called me to go there. And so what he did, he knew that he needed to change the culture in that church because it was, it was just headhunter. So what he did is he got a couple of guys around him when he first got there. He just poured into them, just poured into them for a long time. And then when they were ready, he sent them to get a couple of guys and pour into them and pour into them. So about three, four years later, at silly business meetings, he has like 75 of himself that are raising their hands. Like, that's not, that's not what we believe as Christians. We can't do that. Total culture shift in that church. Why? Because he was reproducing his faith in others. That's what happened with the Sawi tribe. Like, I would love to see a, another reformation. I would love to see another culture, total radical culture shift in the world today. If you've ever studied the Protestant Reformation, man, it was, it was because people didn't have the Bible. And so I think the new Reformation today that we need is people with the truth of Scripture multiplying themselves in others. So there's a couple of things that really just cause us to shrug our shoulders when we have this conversation. Is we're like, golly, I'm not going out this headhunter tribe. Maybe I'm just kind of totally failing with that. Or we're saying, I'm not reproducing myself in the lives of other people. And I'm totally dropping the ball on that. Bill Hall is a, is a discipleship guru. He's written many discipleship books. And, you know, we all want to look at this last command of Jesus and say, maybe I've done that. He said, you know when you've made it, you know when you, you obeyed that commandment to make disciples, when someone that you have discipled is discipling someone. And I think a lot of us hear that and we're like, that's not me. So that's why it's another good, good reason for us to look back up at the title. It's been about 50 years from now. So what about 50 years from now? The people that you've invested in for a long haul, small number of people for a long amount of time and say, you know what? I'm going to focus on you. We're going to dig into the Word together. We're going to pray together. We're going to uh, cry together. We're going to uh, memorize the Bible together. We're going to read. The, we're going to start. We're going to learn how, what it means to walk with Jesus. And then we're going to multiply that. That's the Acts. That's the book of Acts. That's the early church. And there's multiplying, multiplying. Let's keep going. I'll never get done. Um, okay, so what is what is just sitting around enjoying Christ and getting fat and happy look like for us today? <laughs> okay, putting something on the altar. <laughs> That's scary. Paul, that. What else? What do you think? Because he's it, it, saying, you know, these, these people in this tribe—they're not just—they're not just enjoying Christ and taking it for themselves, right, and, t and getting just fat and happy and saying, this is our thing, man, this is us. This is... And they were very intentional, right, about going out, changing the culture, changing their neighbors, infiltrating with, like, <coughs> hot pursuit against a crazy jacked up culture. You said it a second ago. It was um, kind of like pushing away from the people who aren't who don't believe what we believe and finding people that are yeah. like-minded and staying within that. Like, sure. This is my safe place. Everybody knows God in my circle, so I'm not going to go out of it. Yeah. So I and think I th that's what sitting back is. Sure. And I think that we have to be careful that, because I know the pushback is, well, 
you know, you can't get out in the world and be like the world. You know, people say stuff like that, but the only way the gospel is going to go to the world is if you are living your faith in, in the world. Like, there's, that's the only reason. And that's why I think it's so cool when we have baptism videos. Just about every baptism video you watch, it's, well, you know, I was, <laughs> I was working with so-and-so, and they started talking to me about my faith. And so it's happening. It's, it's like, you know, by default, naturally happening around our church, which is good. Really good. And that's, what's, that's, that's cultural changing stuff. That's really, that's really good. We don't want to be a people that's just sitting around enjoying Christ and getting fat and happy. Right? Because everything that you get, everything that God gives you, whether it's a blessing, whether it's some kind of scriptural truth that you are getting tonight, everything that God slides across the table to you and says, enjoy my son, my daughter, that's not just for you. And that's the mindset that we have to think. Every sermon that you hear is not just for you. Every Sunday school lesson, every time of prayer, it's not just for you. Why? Because in Acts chapter 17, Paul talks about there's people that God has allotted the boundaries of people who are groping around in the darkness trying to grab a hold of something. And God has placed you in a good church, good teaching, but it's not just for you. That's sitting around getting fat. You know, just we just drinking it in, man. We're eating it up. Eating, it's good. What is? Well, come on, check it out. You know, that's the part of giving it to others. But it can be more than that. Really investing deeply in the lives of others around you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We saw the disaster in the people of Israel. Yeah, this concept goes way back. It goes way back before the nation of Israel was even a people, right? Genesis 12, God calls to Abram and said, hey, you know what? Hey, check it out, dude. You're out of here. I'm going to make you into a people. Why? Because I'm just going to pour into you, and y'all are going to love it. You're going to roll around in it, and you're just going to be awesome together. Don't worry about anybody else out there. No, it's not what God said, was it? I'm going to, make, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you my people, and you are going to bless others, right? And that's what we're still seeing still see roll through history today is that God is blessing his people to bless others. Yeah, we do our own thing. We create our own culture. It's different than anything else and we're like, hey, we like this. But I think for me, like as you know, I'm 35 and I this grips me, you know, I'm like 50 years from now. I might not be still sucking wind. I might not still be alive in 50 years. I don't know. But I'm going to stand before King Jesus one day. I will. And if the first thing he says is, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm with you always to the end of the age. And he just looks at me. And what do I got? What do I got to account for? Anything, right? What what I've amassed myself, whether it's treasures on this earth, whether it's comfort. And here's what I think: we we really need to remember to take away from tonight is not looking at the Richardsons, even though if God's calling anybody anywhere to do that, I say go. Like if my children come to me and say, "Daddy, God's calling me to Papua New Guinea to reach that crazy headhunter tribe," I'm like, let's pack. I love you. you got to do that. That's great. But we can also look at the people in that tribe that went across the path, right? And that's maybe where most of us are today, right? We're the ones who were changed by the gospel in the midst of the headhunter tribe, and we're the ones that need to go to our neighbor, go across the path, the, the ditch or the, the river or whatever, and we need to infiltrate the culture. And we can take... Believers who are 
who are saved and say, you know what, I'm going to walk with you, we're going to grow as... And I think for a lot of us, we're like, in, in our culture today, I think for a lot of people, we'll be like, you know, I was never discipled. Never, I didn't spend a year with somebody, meeting with them every week, reading the Bible and praying and memorizing the scripture and holding each other accountable. I've been in the ministry for 15 years. I can honestly say, I can't look back at my life and say that happened in my life. That's devastating. So we've totally dropped the ball on Jesus' last command. We've made it our least concern. But we can, be, we can spur this on. Let's skip number five if you want to look at that and talk about it later. Um, so looking at the solid, this is, this is still in, in line with what we're thinking. Look at the solid way of life. It's easy to see some things that they didn't have. But what might be some things that they have that we don't? Did, did part of you, a little bit of you, as you noticed how they lived, did any part of you say, man, they got it good? Am I the only one that said that when I was looking? Like, like it, it, prime example is when the guy's sitting there and he's like, no this or that, no meat, nothing. I slept so good last night. Woke up to the sounds of the jungle. Those are the things like like we like we get caught up in the rat race, right? Nothing. Yeah, and if you've ever visited, if you've ever been on the mission field in any kind of cultural setting like that, it's just deafening. It's it takes you back, and it's just amazingly deafening. Hearing the sounds of nothing except for the birds and the, the you know, people laughing and the smell of everybody burning all kinds of stuff because they got to burn, just burn everything. <laughs> Mr. Scott, yes, sir. Hey, welcome back, by the way. None. Yeah. It, it really is. Yeah, my wife picks on me sometimes about how I'm not very Facebook good. <laughs> That's terrible English, I know. But <laughs> I'm not very good with social media. And somebody today was asking me, hey, did you see so-and-so, so-and-so, such-and-so? And I'm like, no, I haven't really been on Facebook too much lately. You know, I, just like, I guess maybe I just like to disconnect sometimes. Like, I look at that and be like, dude, I want to, like, sleep on the floor in a hut in some headhunter trial. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> So I think that it's okay for us to, to watch that. It's okay for you to say, I wouldn't, nowhere in a million years would I be slapping the bugs off my forehead, would I be sleeping in that hammock and eating them bugs and, you know, just seeing the pigs piled up. And, and part of me is thinking, man, I wish they kind of would have cut that out. But I think it's okay because, you know, that's, that's true of their culture. It's how they eat. It's how they, you know, they're happy with that. They're okay. It's disgusting for a lot of us. Eat, eat any worms lately? Probably not. So I think it's okay for some people to be like, that's you. That's all you. Like me, I, I would be like, God, if you want me to go live there, please send me. Like I, I, I'll eat the bugs. I'll eat the bugs. I've eaten bugs before. I'll do it. And so, but for you, who may be saying, you're crazy. Well, I am a little crazy. That's okay. Um, it's cool sometimes. Um, but that's that doesn't fall outside of what all the way back to the beginning of what we were talking about with the Great Commission. Because everybody's called to make disciples. Whether you are never in a million years touch a bug, well, you touch people, you touch Jesus, touch others. And so, like, you, you got to think, like, some of the people that live in that tribe, they would be absolutely appalled to come back to Memphis, Tennessee, where they're from or whatever. Like, there's no way I'm going ever going to Michigan. There's no way I'd ever go to Gulfport, Mississippi. Like, I'm in the jungle, in my hut, in my hammock, eating bugs. That's all I want. That's what they know. So it's, it's back and forth. It's both ways. But the truth of the, of the command of Jesus' last command, hey, make disciples. Like, we got to make that fit into, into our life, into our culture, into our existence. So in the video, number seven, anybody else got any other comments or questions or anything? I told them losing you tonight. Let me know. Send me an email if this was bad. <laughs> yes, sir. True. Yep. There's. Um, you have to. You got to love Jesus. You got to walk with Jesus. To make disciples, you got to know the Lord. You got to know the true disciple maker. Now, people can be curious of your faith. It doesn't necessarily mean they'll be. Re they're ready to be discipled. You know, they're ready to 
get saved. <laughs> They're ready to hear more of the gospel. Not necessarily walk deeply, memorizing scripture, praying together, holding each other accountable, because they're, they're they're curious. They're not Christians, right? So you know, some some technical things maybe that when you start thinking through. And you know, the reason I'm talking about this tonight is because you're going to be you, our church. Like we're really going to start talking, uh, you know, a good bit more about this. And I, and I think that. I think for the most part, everybody that's hearing this, you, you want that. Because maybe you're like me, and you're like, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that kind of relationship with a, a couple of people. I didn't know that kind of deep community. Because we can all, when we start talking about isolation, right? Like we can all feel isolated. Hey, we got secrets, pal. We got darkness that we come to. Muted. Is that really healthy? Think back of the darkness and the secrets that you've had and you've kept for a long time. What if five years ago, before you slipped down that slope, you had a solid believer, a couple of them in your life, that you were in constant contact with, that you prayed together, you read the Bible together, you held each other accountable. Hey, tell me about... Tell me about your, your, the lowest part of your week. What was the best part of your week this week? What was the worst part of your week? I think that a whole lot of disastrous situations in our lives have been avoided if we had that type of discipleship that was real in our life. Wouldn't you think so? I, I know. I know so. I can look back at some of the, some of the potholes and pits that I fell in and dug myself in my life. And I, I can think, you know, if I had somebody in my life that was walking close with me, they'd have been like, hey, coming up, you see that? Who? Oh, yeah, thanks for pointing that out to me. Man, I'd have dove right off into that thing if you didn't say anything to me. Let's walk around it together. Did you have somebody that walked around the holes in your life with you together? Or were you like so many Christians in our culture, in our world, in our country, they're just walking their path by themselves? It doesn't work. Case in point, we live in a culture of headhunters. So we got to be counterculture and say, you know what? I'm going to open up my life. I'm going to invest in people. I'm going to have somebody invest in me. doesn't mean you're ready to disciple somebody. Maybe you're ready to be discipled. Number eight. Um, or number seven, if, you, if anybody want to comment on that in the video, in the video that baptized 50 people, what if, what if anything stood out about that portion of the video? Anything jumped out at you when you're talking about the, you saw me baptized? Side note at all, anything? Yeah, evangelism is taking place. Absolutely. Yeah, they're sharing their faith. Evangelism is definitely taking place. Evangelism and discipleship, they, got, they go hand in hand together. Okay, number eight, uh, the following statement was made about the solid people. They shared a sense of significance by virtue of their story that was being told. What is the significance of your own personal story that needs to be told? Okay, in other words, what does your video look like 50 years from now? You know? Yeah, we're not all going to have a book with our name on it. We're not going to all have a video team follow us to the tribe out in you know some remote place to... And we reconnect with the 14 tribes that we unified with the radical gospel. And, you know, that's not going to be our story. But what is it? What is, what, what is your video going to look like 50 years from now? What's it going to... What's, what's it going to be when you stand before King Jesus? And, and he says, our last command was make disciples. Like, do we want to be, well, I'm, I'm in. I believe. <laughs> like, and we'll go to heaven. I mean, you got to accept faith in Christ, believe, walk with him, love him, worship him, know him, grow in your knowledge of him. And we're pretty good around here about letting you grow in your knowledge. We're some sharp people at this church. But you know what? I mean, it's you know, reproduction. Reproduce our faith in the lives of others. Revelation chapter 7. Verse 9 through 12 says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, 
from all tribes and peoples and languages. Gulfport, Mississippi was there. <laughs> Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The reality is we win. We do. We win. But in the wake of what of where we're going, the trajectory towards our V, our, v, our win. We get a victory, okay? Like we get, we're heading there. But in the wake behind us, I say that we leave a path of discipleship. We leave a path of reproduction. 50 years from now. Who's, who's going to be, it was Moses, right? Moses standing there talking to that guy and he was holding and saying, we, we, we walk together. We loved each other. We, 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 we did this together. And now I'm doing it in somebody else, and they're doing it in somebody else. Brian, Brian did a good job of, of talking about how multiplication works when he preached a couple weeks back. Like with the evangelist, if the evangelist shared Christ and got someone saved every day of the year, and then a disciple maker led someone to faith in Christ, but then they discipled that person, and then they, they had another person the next year, and, and multiplication radically changes them. Right? So, uh, if anything to take away tonight, I would say that if you, just a simple, the, the simple principle that I talked about earlier about whatever you get, it's not just for you. Right? So even tomorrow, even at work, like, hey, somebody needs to hear what you talked about tonight. So, somebody needs to hear about maybe Peace Child. Hey, I heard a cool story about a tribe that you know, maybe get the book, read it. Get the, check out that video. Renee said it was on YouTube. You know, watch that again. Learn a little bit more about that. How cool would it be for you to tell somebody that story? Maybe, maybe you're like, man, I don't have a cool story like that. So borrow someone else's story. What do you think preachers do all the time? They're always hijacking your stories. That guy came to our church. He did. He came to our church one night. Yeah, Don Richardson, years back, came, came here and talked about Peace Child. That's pretty, that was pretty... I was way before my time here. But anyway, um, I'm, any other comments before we close in prayer? Because we're, we're pretty much done. I think the video speaks highly of, of itself. The concepts we've talked about is good. You don't necessarily have to go away like you've been beat up tonight. You know? Go away thinking, hey, you know what? There might still be a chance for me to add some to that video 50 years from now. What can, what can we do? Yeah. So... Any other comments, additions, subtractions? Amen. Well, let's pray. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for tonight. God, I pray, God, that whatever you give us, God, that we give it to our neighbor and we give it to the native. God, whatever you're calling us to do, God, I pray that we do that wholeheartedly. Lord, your, your command to make disciples, um, God, I pray that, that your command to make disciples was not our least concerned, but it was at the forefront of what we were all about. So God, I pray that you would, uh, as you continue to shape this understanding and of just intentional, deep, true discipleship at our church, God, I pray that you would just continue to let us embrace that, regardless of how scary or messy that might look. God, we, we're ready. Lord, we want to we do what you're calling us to do. We thank you so much, God, for tonight, God, in the, the many ways, Lord, that you're being served tonight here, God, in the many ways, God, that you're being glorified tonight. I pray, God, in this place, in this room, Lord, that, that you, are, you are glorified. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen.